Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. As usual, we have uh, a few late arrivals, so don't be surprised if somebody shuffles in part way through the talk. But thank you very much for coming along. On the chairs are the flyers for the talk after this, which is um, based on the regimental archives. And Heather Needham, who often comes along to the talks, is the archivist there. And uh, it should be fun. And the great thing will be, if you are ex green jacket, will you spot yourself in amongst the archives? And there's one or two people who I'm sure will find photographs of that I've put up. Um, but this evening's talk is from David Smith. And he is somebody who looks into the future and uh, makes extrapolates really predictions from that. I won't say any more about it, apart from the fact that he is a, an international speaker. It's how he makes his living, and we're very lucky to have you here this evening, David. Thank, Thank you very much for coming. Bless you. Thank you. It's my privilege to be here. Um, never mind your privilege. That, uh, even, I'll say that before you even hear me speak, because that's the only time I might get away with that. <laughs> but it is my privilege to be here. I'm delighted to be here asked me to come and speak about buttons to, and bayonets, which is great. Uh, uh, an interesting subject, um, especially as the Royal Green Jackets don't have uh, bayonets as such, but I didn't learn that much. And, of course, it's only to catch up with Penny again. So, anyway, good evening to you all. And I put a few thoughts together uh, in terms of uh, warfare in terms of how it might uh, morph into something different in the next several years. And, of course, it's in a state of uh, a flux <coughs> perennially, so it's not like it's a, a, a new thing. It's a, an endless change. So, first of all, I thought, OK, look, bayonets, let's get that out of the way early on. And um, we've been using these now for, I don't know, uh, for, this is the 17th century, so, I don't know, 21st century now, so 400 years or thereabouts. So everything that needs to be known about bayonets is known. That's all I'm going to say pretty much about them in terms of their history, because I don't dwell on that. I am, uh, as Bia says, a professional futurist, and I help organisations think about where they're going and what it might be like when they get there, irrespective of what strategy that they may have to path the way. So that's what I'm about. But I thought it'd be interesting to look up how bayonets are used today. So I found this interesting story about the, um, in 2004 in Basra, how the uh, Princess of Wales uh, Royal Regiment uh, made a very famous and successful bayonet charge uh, against um, Shiite militia. And um, very successful, with 20 of them uh, ended up relatively unscathed, three injured, and 28 of the enemy uh, were disposed of in the process. And it caught everyone by surprise. So uh, almost, if it's a, a, the, the, I raise that now because the question of bayonets to buttons isn't really it. Because uh, we, have, we add everything uh, that we do in life. We very rarely dispose of anything. In fact, the only job I think that you can generally say is being made redundant in the whole of commercial world is the lift operator. <laughs> uh, everybody else, they're there. Even gas lamp lighters are in the Royal Parks in London. So almost everything has a very long tail, and so will Ben. And so thinking about that, OK, we've had the era of the buttons in the 1950s. We've had the inter intercontinental ballistic missile. Um, and it was obviously, uh, Werner Brown was developing something similar during the Second World War. By the end of the 50s, that was perfected, and the era of nuclear-tipped intercontinental, intercontinental ballistic missiles uh, was with us. Uh, and we've been living under the shadow of that, and with it, um, for good and bad, uh, and both are in equal measure, if you like, over a long time. But we are entering into an era of the uh, autonomous swarm warfare. So we're now beginning to move towards something quite different. Uh, it maybe invites us to think differently about how we organise ourselves, to make the most of that, and how to defend against that. Uh, and I'm going to ex expand on that just a little bit tonight, if that's okay. So I hope that's vaguely what you've come here to hear, he says. That's a rhetorical question. Nobody wants an answer to that. So, okay, I thought, look, well, the things that are driving the way the world is organised are, are, broadly speaking, these seven headings. And uh, each one has a great deal of depth uh, behind it. And I'm not going to spend much time on all of those tonight, but I will talk a little bit about the way the world's organised, somewhat... Uh, on people uh, and demographics as a consequence, but mostly about technology, because this is a time when technology is yet again taking a front seat in telling us uh, uh, that we have opportunities to embrace, change, or, or reject. But I thought it would be interesting to look back at some past technologies. And here we have the First World War tank, Churchill, and the, uh, the Challenger II. And at the aide de camp, the Field Marshal Haig said, the idea that cavalry will be replaced by these iron coaches is absurd 
is little short of treasonous. So, okay, now we can get one of two things wrong, and that's perfectly reasonable to find something that's clunky, doesn't work very well, is never going to make any difference. But it turned out it did, somewhat, um, whatever we call them. Then the uh, Holland submarine was in action in, in 1900. That led to the Second World War submarine and our Trident uh, missile fire and nuclear deterrent. And H.G. Wells, you could almost think, was be a reasonably creative person, so he couldn't see it doing anything else than suffocating the crew and floundering at sea. So, okay, well, we couldn't see that there was much purpose in having a submarine fleet, so we wouldn't bother with that. So we're not having tanks, we're not having submarine fleet. That's out the way, dealt with. And, and finally, aircraft. De Havilland SE-5A, most successful aircraft in the First World War. Hurricane, of course, we know its role, F-35. Fosh, ran the war for a while. Interesting toys, but no military value. So broadly speaking, you know, we find it quite difficult to see things in their early vestige of ever being valuable, ever turning into something worthwhile. And, and that, that gives us a chance to think, what might it be if there's lots of them and it grows up and it works? Uh, and sometimes you have to also say it's legal, because some things aren't terribly legal. So that's me looking back. I don't want to dwell on that. But what's interesting about that is we now spend all of our defence money building ships to transport our aircraft. So gradually we have absorbed more and more of what we want to do and project power through aircraft with ships on this occasion. I'm not talking about that because that's controversial. But I think that it's interesting that Maynard Keynes, a famous economist, said that it's better to be roughly right than precisely wrong. And holding the future with relatively loose hands to think about how it might turn out. And that's why I think multiple futures is a helpful thing rather than saying that's the way it'll be because it's actually not likely to be exactly like that. So having multiple futures is a good thing, and being divergent in thinking. And we find all that terribly difficult. The good news is the military find that no easier or harder than all of, of commercial life. <coughs> Everybody in commercial life is struggling with a whole range of new technologies and players that can disrupt and are disrupting everything they want to do. So that's me looking back and thinking about that. And I thought we'll do the world in five slides. We're not going to dwell on it, so you can imagine this is not very detailed, but it'll give you a, a vague flavour. So, OK, it's all about change. The first thing is that the green bit is where people used to be born and stayed alive uh, in, in the past. The purple bit is where everybody who wasn't around before is now staying alive and living somewhere else. So if you think about when I was born, there were sort of two billion people, and when I went to work, there were sort of five, and today there are seven, and we're heading towards ten. So there's just this amazing one-off cascade of people. We're fantastically good at producing people. That's quite a natural thing for human beings to want to do. We're going to tail off eventually, is why it doesn't go on forever, but actually we're going to produce a lot of people, and we're getting better at keeping people alive, and they're not where they used to be. So we've got 195 countries in the world, uh, and they're there. And about a third of them, by 2050, will live in predominantly Muslim countries. That doesn't make them Muslim, but they live in that culture, uh, uh, and that has an impact on what they do. So... That's populations. Um, this is a, a map of where they live. So this is looking at the size of cities, and I'm not going to get into the detail of the size of cities, but broadly they're well spread, including Tokyo, New York, elsewhere. It's like a weather map, this, isn't it? Um, ultimately, of course, we end up around Africa and India. Uh, the rest of the world doesn't compete in terms of volume of people in cities. Uh, we're left behind. We're talking now of cities that aren't 10 million, because there are already 200 of those in China. It's, it's cities of, of 50, 60, 80, 100 million people. And the economies of running cities with 100 million people are the opposite of the way you run economies of cities of 5 and 10 million. You simply cannot do the same things, and therefore you do very different things. And what's quite exciting is, is within 10 years, 60% of people on Earth will live in uh, urban settings. And that's almost the opposite. It was 30 or 40% if you go back 30 years. So we have changed the number of people, where they're living, and how we live in one lifetime. And, and we can't really use our memory because it's the wrong paradigm to compare how the future is going to look. This is where water stress is, and I won't talk about this for a lot, but this middle bit, if you remember where all the, all the people were, is where we're going to be water stressed. And of course, people have been anticipating resource wars, water wars, for a long time. There are already police forces around the Middle East whose job is to stop nations seeding silver nitrate into the clouds for early raindrop. The United Nations have been doing that for decades, which is why you've not heard of wars in places where they're struggling with water. There's enormous efforts already gone into it. This is going to get staggeringly more interesting, if I put it in that term. So, 
Consequence of all those people being born somewhere else, staying alive, being better educated, better access to money, doing more things, the world's economy is about to explode. You'll hear endlessly about recessions, but they're very temporary things. We go up and down in recessions and panics and call them what you will, but actually, in terms of the, num- the amount of money in the world, it's increasing at a dramatic rate. And just to give me a break and to give you something to think about, how much is the turnover of the world at the moment in sort of GDP terms? What do you think? Only one person's ever got this right as a school child at my son's school. Don't worry, nobody else ever gets anywhere close. 20 trillion. 20 trillion, not a bad guess. 68. So today it's 68 trillion dollars, and we're going to double and treble that in the next 30, 40 years. That's cool, isn't it? So we have massive more money in new places with new people doing new things with new cultures. So that's quite good. That's slide four of this thing. And then finally, uh, as an example, the G7, which used to run the world, is now being overtaken by other uh, countries, if you like, with influence. And the emerging seven, for example, is taking over. It was half of the G7. If you go back 15 years or so, 25 years, if you go back three or four years, it was equal to a G7 size. And by 2040 or thereabouts, probably slightly earlier, the emerging seven, which includes Brazil, Russia, India, China, which hadn't done this, Mexico, uh, Indonesia, and Turkey, those countries will be double the turnover of the G7. And of course, with economic activity, well, economic, economic might goes political power. And we're beginning to see that change around. In fact, there's an interesting website which shows you where political power was vested in the last 200 years. And it's a little dot that wandered away from China because they used to run the world. Well, they didn't run the world, they ran their bit, which was most of the world. And effectively, it wanders off towards America, turns, turns around at Newfoundland, and it comes back across Europe and is heading back towards Asia. So the way that we look at the way the world works is changing drastically. And if I keep talking at this rate, we're going to be here all night. So we need to speed things up a bit. So I don't mean speed speed the words up. I mean the subjects. Interesting. uh, General Mark Milley said this, that it's it's not the the nature of war is going to change, but the character of war is likely to be impacted quite dramatically from the things that are going on. And it's not just urbanisation or the locale or where that's happening or why it's happening uh, and the tools we're using. It's a combination of all those and a few things more. So you could spend all night on this, but effectively these revolutions and world wars and uh, information revolution, autonomous revolution, have all brought particular paradigms of how, if you like, war is fought, how resources are acquired and how how we we choose to um, compete with each other militarily. The first five and six of those, before we get to the information revolution and the autonomous revolution, which I hope I'll make more sense of in a minute, um, broadly speaking, troops haven't changed that much. I know I'm risking a great deal by saying that, but relative to what is coming, if you like, um, it's a relatively uh, little change. Should, should I leave now? <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> should dig a bigger hole. So, I've got also, let's look at natives. I mean, Trump has said one or two things about NATO. Uh, that, that's his will, if he wants to. But broadly speaking, others, Michael Rule, who's been uh, involved in, in NATO for a very long time in various roles and is now in, in the energy um, syndicate or operation of, of, of um, unexpected change in NATO, <coughs> saying that really Europe is going to be struggling to coordinate itself to provide any military compensation for the lack of US in, in NATO. Uh, and of course that's reflected by a comment from the US about it taking perhaps 15 years to fill the gap effectively if the US were to withdraw and it's probably a lot more influential than just simply filling a gap also because it's a, 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 um, uh, an alliance um, and I've, I've listened to Vier on many occasions talking about the complexity if you like of the people's engagement or rules of engagement that they allow their participants to, to to, to involve themselves in. And of course, in a 29 year, uh, alliance environment, that's going to be quite a challenge, given that everything's speeding up. Uh, and it is. Uh, I know I haven't come to that yet, but it, but it sort of is. So, maybe just the fact that we don't operate as a group already, we operate independently. The EU thinks it's going to operate more cohesively with its current announcements, but broadly speaking, we spend nearly all of our defence nationally and not um, even regionally with other partners. So 90% or thereabouts of our national, of our um, defence research is nationally based, even though we may cooperate in some ways with others. And of course, those who are in NATO, and the last one on NATO, you've got um, Turkey here, you've got Erdogan, who's recently been uh, courting and working with 
Iran and um, Russia, in this case particularly sorting out post-civil um, war in Syria, but of course, uh, well not of course, but on that occasion he spurned a meeting in Poland and NATO. <laughs> so he's looking another way, if you like, and he's thinking about putting in ground-to-air missiles that are from Russia, which has generated a rather interesting response from the US. So the, the interesting, these alliances that have been in place for quite a long time are showing degrees, and they probably always have, but at least demonstrating degrees of, of fracture. So without getting into that too much, all this is telling us that we used to fight each other as nations. We, we then fight um, a, a very occasionally as a military force against military force, but actually most of it's a state versus armed insurrection in state. So most of the battles that have happened and are forecast to happen are mostly <coughs> going to be um, intrastate uh, battles. Uh, and of course that requires a different approach, as you well know, seeing as you've been involved in much of that. Increasingly, our police force of many countries is looking more militaristic. It's getting more militaristic um, weaponry. It's getting more militaristic in its guise and even its operation to some extent. So on the one hand, we, we, we don't want to employ the military in our nations for all the reasons that we know, but we increasingly want our police to act like a military force when we're under um, attack by bodies who have different viewpoints equally some countries have been using their military for police actions. So Sweden chose not to rule out using the military to quell um, uh, violence that they found last year. Venezuela, they're responsible for a third of all killings in the country already. Uh, they're very active, whether that's good or bad. Military are fighting the drug war in Mexico, and Brazil's used the military to clear up their act before the uh, Olympic Games. So it's really interesting blurring of roles in many countries as I say, it isn't, there isn't one model anymore. There's multiple models with multiple players uh, that are, are changing the way things have traditionally worked. Uh, this did have America in it, but I took the word out, so I think it applies to anybody who's technologically focused, which is the high-end way of war is not the only way uh, of war. I mean, we know that, and we've all seen that. We've seen sort of insurgent approach and their um, uh, IEDs and what have you. But McMaster said this, and he was the, um, the, the U.S., um, national security advisor amongst me in general, there are two ways to fight the United States, asymmetrically, I head on, or stupid. And I sort of think that sums up pretty much what folk have to contend with uh, amongst most of the military engagements that we're likely to embrace going forward. Equally, the strengths that we, we have are obviously going to be sought by an enemy to negate those strengths, and if it is technology, they're going to look to overturn that technological strength. Uh, and maybe that reliance on technology in this case uh, which may be, or maybe not creeping up, um, makes a vulnerability that we may need to cope with. So technology is um, it's very difficult. I, was, I started in technology in 1973, and it was relatively easy. Uh, and we've had uh, waves of technology in that time, all of which has been quite disruptive and difficult, but never, by, never that hard. Uh, it's really the, the, the raft of new technologies now that, broadly speaking, half people talk about it haven't got a clue what it is. Uh, and I have got half an idea what it is. Uh, and I've been looking at it, talking about it for quite a long time, and occasionally you find somebody really gets it, and it's quite unusual. Uh, we know what the fantasies are. So, of course, the F-35 is something exciting we're going to populate our, our um, aircraft carriers with, but maybe it's designed more for a conventional war as opposed to an insurgent war. Of course, we've got some of those coming. I think we've committed to 48. The Japanese one that fell into the water a while ago isn't the good news, but that's a different variant, at least, so there's some hope. But these are 48 we have on order, out of 138 in total. Uh, and China and, and Russia continue to buy, if they do turn out to be any form of enemy, they, uh, they continue to buy conventional weapon, weapons, but they do do different things with them. And that's one of the things I think I've found quite interesting, which is one of the things that China's done is arm its fishing fleet. Uh, and, of course, it's got lots of difficulty in the South China Sea as far as they're concerned. They have 2,600 distant water fishing fleet, and they see their navy as navy, coast guard, and fishing fleet. And the, the fishing fleet has so far taken part in the last three years uh, in 250 uh, legal activities. I, they, they've been uh, ejecting people from what they believe to be their legal right to own land. So they're projecting forces using different uh, resources um, uh, than they had before, which is confusing that whole area quite dramatically. And of course, Vietnam and, uh, and the Philippines are equally building um, runways on uh, various atolls. So quite interesting what's going on there. 
Jack Welsh, who used to run GE and has turned it, broadly speaking, into a software company. So for all the things that it used to be, it's now a software company. <laughs> Completely different scene, the light in terms of heavy industry and any success you might be able to make of that. And he talks about the how we might need to organise as a consequence of all this. And that's one of the things that's quite fascinating. And of course, business has copied this um, militaristic you know, command and control information passing process, which is perfectly good in a relatively stable environment, uh, and it's excellent at delivering quality and reliability and, uh, and predictability, but it's not so good when you, you're endlessly having to reconfigure how you might marshal your resources to do whatever you want to do. So nearly every company I talk to, and mostly its boards of directors, are struggling with what do they do, because everyone I ask to put your organisation chart up, and they all look like that. The boss is at the top, then everybody is slightly uh, senior at the top, then down to the poor people at the bottom. And nothing of that works. And we're seeing now some quite dramatic changes by organisations who embrace it. But increasingly, it ends up looking like that. Now, you might need a hierarchical chart to try and express control, uh, order, if you like. But in terms of operational, it tends to be much more modular, much more multi-engaged and nimble in terms of how to reconfigure. So actually, the Royal Green Jackets... Uh, mission, if you like, its style of operation is much more akin to the way so many other parts of not just military but commercial life need to react to make the most of what they're needing to do. So, public sector folk are having to work with twice as many partners as they did even two years ago. And that in, in and of itself is quite dramatic and hard for a lot of people. Partnering is difficult. Most people want to own things, they don't want a partner. Because a partner I can't really control in the same way. Uh, but, of course, if I own them and take it over, uh, I, can, I can control it in that way. Equally, the technology that we use to run our worlds, whether it's military or commercial, uh, is usually outdated. And, unfortunately, legacy, as everyone calls it, which is also a bit rude, uh, but, nonetheless, it means it's, it's relatively inflexible and it's quite difficult to change the technology to run things in a new way for a new world. Does that make sense? This is all a bit overwhelming. A bit too much. A bit too fast. I'll try and slow down. My wife will tell me off. She's not allowed out very often to come and see me speak, but I know she will tell me off. So I'm just predicting that. Uh, I'm good at that. I'm a futurist. So the, um, where are we? Trump and, uh, you know, okay, so maybe the way we like to do things is because that's the way we've organised things to do it that way. So rather than confronting new ways of doing things, we would actually prefer to look at the advantages we have and hope that world still exists, that we can engage. And that's true all around the world, I can assure you, folk mostly decline when their market's moved. Uh, and that's very common. So they do nothing wrong at all, but the thing that they are servicing, the thing that they are existing for, has moved off somewhere else, and it has a different attitude. So technology, so this is broadly speaking, this is the, um, if you like, the bayonets to uh, button bit. This is the bulk of it now. I suppose you could argue we're on the downslope, but as do we aren't. So the, we, we're now looking at this. Arthur C. Clarke was, a, was a, a science fiction writer, but he had this wonderful expression, which you've now read, of course, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. I mean, can you imagine 10 years ago trying to explain to somebody that you can read your newspaper on a piece of glass? I mean, that would have seemed bonkers, wouldn't it? Or, or anything you can do on a mobile phone. It's basically a small computer in your pocket. And some people have just given up and said, that's too hard. Forget it. I don't want anything to do with that. And that's equally fine. So, you know, if you were to follow this timeline, rifle, cannon, night vision, GPS, autonomy, all bits of technology that have sort of revolutionised some aspect of warfare. But we often think the future, and the future of technology, and the future of the, of the world we're in, is just another version of today. It's not massively disrupted because of the things that we're embracing. And that's not uncommon. <laughs> we see it as, a, OK, it's going to be different. We're going to use new technology to do what we've always done better. That's a relief, we can go on holiday now. We've cracked it. But actually, that's not true. Because actually, we work out what that new thing is, and if we, we don't do it, others will, and therefore we have to react to what that new technology truly allows people to do. And Mark Arden Smith said this, that it's actually, we need to look at the versions of technology that are likely to drive exponential change that will allow the military to stay abreast and ahead of any issues that you might have to confront going forward. McKinsey said this, that um, this fourth industrial revolution that people like to call it is happening 10 times faster with 300 times the scale 
and therefore 3,000 times the impact of the last Industrial Revolution. There's very little time to relax. There's very little time to ponder and think. There's very little time to experiment. It really is a case of embracing and trying and, and committing or exiting very quickly. Um, and that is a philosophy that a lot of elements of, of, of business, of, of commerce uh, and abroad have taken up already to think about how do you deal with the speed of that. All of these technologies, and I'm barely going to comment on them, so you know, please don't, I don't want to lose you yet, but you know, Internet of Things, Internet of Nano, Data and Analytics, Blockchain, AI and Automation and Drones, you'll have heard a lot about, Quantum Computing, various forms of reality, virtual reality, uh, augmented reality, mixed reality, 3 and 4D fabrication, 5G, gene health, and new materials are but a few of hundreds. So this isn't the end of it. Um, this is of hundreds. And at best, I'm going to put a picture up of them uh, so we can be on the same page, so to speak, rather than do anything more. But, OK, militarily, the object is to try and speed up our engagement with new technologies, at, if you like, a lower cost, because often it's not always worked out well when we're doing research uh, militaristically, and there's reasons for that, of course. But a lot of these technologies, I've picked a few, are uh, dual purpose. They are just as applicable for the military as they are for commercial and domestic use. And therefore, we can piggyback on the back of some of those that research and development thinking. And I just put up here a few of the companies who are getting <coughs> funded uh, to develop these new technologies. And um, 3D printing, there's about um, 2 billion of funding. These companies in artificial intelligence have got $40 billion of funding. Health has got, which is all sorts of things, $77 billion of funding. It all comes to Internet of Things, blockchain, security technology, all of those are applicable to the military for the new forms of engagement that we are likely to have, and that comes to $200 billion. So in terms of the amount of money that's being put into new technologies, and the reason I share that is not just to have fun with the number, is that some of those are going to work. You know, if there was a little amount of money, it could fail. But actually when you put that much money in, some of those ventures are going to turn into very real changes in the way we do things. So... The military uh, in the UK has found a budget to engage with these folk and increasingly piggyback off uh, their learnings, their experiences. And I think it's a fantastic idea to collaborate to try and get the best out of what's happening. And these are a few, without going into them, um, where J-Hub, which is the UK uh, joint innovation uh, play, has deployed already a number of products, but they, they're going to look at artificial intelligence and some of these other technologies to already bring products into the military to change the way that we counter uh, threats that we might have from different sources. Of course we're going to be more urban. We talked about that a moment ago. Um, around two-thirds of the world will be in urban situations if you go forward the next three or four decades. So it's massively swinging from 20% when I was born to 60 to 70% uh, by 2050. That's an enormous change. And of course how we operate in, in cities and how cities operate, and as I mentioned before, the size of those cities <coughs> is going to change uh, dramatically. So, urban warfare can be generated by all manner of reason, and we're seeing failed states, their consequences, but it could just as easily be failed harvest and hundreds of millions of people impacted. I remember putting a slide up a few years ago saying that Europe would probably have over five years 150 mi million migrants. Uh, and that was about five, six years ago, and it wasn't because I was so clever. I picked it from somewhere that seemed very credible, but, of course, we're seeing that massively from Africa and Asia and other nations and changing the nature of our composition of people. Economic collapse, refugees we've seen a lot of, and populist parties which may or may not deliver any great change, I guess. So artificial intelligence, and the purpose of this is not to go over all these because that would be so dull, but AI isn't one thing. You know, it's much, much smarter thinking machines, if you like, but it's divided up into many different forms, all of which can have a huge impact in terms of how we do things. But what's interesting in facial recognition, we now have the capacity to interrogate your features, identify you, but unfortunately that can also be used to identify cohorts of people. And it can be used oppressively as well as, uh, as successfully to pick out folk who perhaps need to be identified. Um, AI robots, we of course will have robots. This isn't a question of if, but when, and what sort of form they'll take. And that's the nature of what's happening right now. And, of course, it's the 
the collaboration of human and machine, which leads to this thing called the age of the cobot. And it is a thing, believe it or not. I haven't just made it up, although I could do. Um, it's a cooperative robot. It's not taking the person's role over, far from it, but it's augmenting what they do with the sort of capability that a robot of some sort can bring. And of course, it's relatively disposable, and that's one of the key things about modern warfare technologies. They are broadly unmanned and therefore relatively disposable. Equally, fake news, we heard a lot about during the 2016 election, so uh, you can manipulate whatever you like now in terms of uh, uh, look of someone. In fact, you can go further than that now. You can easily identify the components of a face. And, and over here, you've got Theresa May. This is, this is a real film. That one was made, and she's voicing a different message altogether. So we are incredibly good now with artificial intelligence at manipulating news of putting words in people's mouths and broadcasting them. So controlling that is almost impossible, but it's the absolute game in town. It, it, managing the, the message, managing the, uh, the intelligence, if you like, and the information wars is absolutely the heart of, uh, of the next major complex we'll have. So cyber attacks will very likely happen, and they could cost an enormous amount of money. Some are forecasting the next major cyber attack, 193 million um, dollars in cost, uh, just looking at it reasonably in terms of cyber attack, and we're open to all sorts of cyber attack. And this stuff about Huawei and its routers being inappropriate for 5G rollout, it's not because they're so devious, which they could or could not be, is their equipment is broadly speaking rubbish. Uh, it's got so many holes in it and so many back doors that any idiot with a, with a, with a coding pad can get into it. So this is one of the things, they, they promised one and a half billion dollars to rectify the errors. Oh, good luck, they do it, that's great. But right now it's not a good, it's not secure at all. Equally, cyber attacks and warfare is one of the top things that the World Economic Forum uh, are foreseeing as well. So it's not like it's coming from one particular uh, voice, it's coming from multiple voices, and it's one of the greatest risks, because the capability of shutting down everything that's connected in some means or manner to technology and, of course, many of these things uh, are, are difficult to identify the source, whether it's a cyber attack or it's a nerve agent or whether it's autonomous drones. Finding the source of those uh, interdicting devices is going to get increasingly hard because they're, they're getting cleverer, as we are, actually, of, of hiding sources of information and routes of information. So if you like that whole fog of war, the war in the shadows that's already existed is about to get a lot more uh, visible and physical because it can. So, what's cool about um, thinking backwards about warfare is that in the old days we used to um, as a war, be able to be a warlord and now we've got billionaires and multi multinational corporations everyone who's got tens of billions of dollars can hire a, their own army and go into bat. And of course we did that with the British East India uh, company some years ago and sent that off. And of course the Dutch were doing the same thing and the French uh, and others. So traditionally, we've used companies to uh, go off and venture, and they ultimately claimed nations on behalf of, of Britain, um, but they didn't start off with that intent particularly. So that's um, only an anomaly the last few hundred years that we've sort of not realised that this was a reasonable thing to do. So we could have an Apple army and a Google army and a Facebook army and a Twitter army, and that'd be reasonable, and they might fight each other somewhere. Who knows? But at the same time, we're more civilised in so many ways, arguably, and we are more legalistic, uh, that, uh, that, that is much harder to do. Interesting change, though, nonetheless. Equally, um, how we operate, uh, tradition has got to change. If you operate in skirmishing groups, uh, as you talked about a moment ago, if you, if you operate already in small groups, flexible, um, reactive to environment, then, of course, that's absolutely perfect. That is exactly the model that most companies are desperate to try and get into. In fact, one organisation that makes washing machines, fridges, freezers, microwaves... It is Chinese, it is the number one in the world, it does own all the big brands. Uh, they've decided to break their company up into 4,000 10 and 15 man companies. So 4,000 units. And they'll configure around those 4,000 units. And they all do different components of what's needed. Uh, and that's a reaction to the way the world works. And they're making fridges and freezers. So it's not terribly exciting. I can't work out how you do that, but that's, they've done it. So, is it about pressing the button? Is it about letting loose these various forms of new warfare uh, or is it slightly more than that? So maybe it is 
be able to sit back and control drones from a distance. Uh, you know, I know we even had, we even staggered. You know, we're finding it hard to award um, uh, medals for performance to those that aren't in the combat zone because they were hundreds of miles away. So we've got to figure everything about reward systems and honor, honor systems. But you know, maybe it makes it more likely we'll have war if we can just go to the go and bomb somewhere and go for lunch. Uh, and there's no danger to you whatsoever. So those things are as good for us to do as do they make it more likely we might embrace warfare. Equally, we are supposed to protect ourselves against the ability of many new forms of, of attack, uh, and we haven't done. And nanotechnology, this is a working um, metal and silicon mosquito that can fly for real. Uh, and can deposit various things wherever it's flown. And these can be air launched, of course, and dropped over anywhere. So our ability to, to combat these sorts of tiny devices, synthetic biology, big data, machine learning, all of those things uh, we find very hard to control. Obviously, we've got used to seeing Reaper drones, and we've seen these micro drones, which are fantastic for flying and seeing over walls so that our troops can be protected when they're in complex areas, and we'll see more of those. But increasingly... You know, along with this, this drone, it's got the um, Brimstone missiles, it's just been fitted, air-to-ground missiles, brand new. This is a Predator um, uh, drone, and this is still operated by somebody, but it's increasingly, if you read the small print, becoming autonomous, because there's no reason why not. And of course, the Americans have got a, pro a project called Maven, and its stated goal is to make their drones autonomous. So we have equipment in the field doing things at our behest against a set of rules, but nonetheless, will we press the button, or will the button be pressed by the AI and the technology, the knowledge, and the face recognition? And that's the interesting place where we've arrived at in so many ways. But even more exciting, I think at least, is drones operating in hundreds. So hundreds of drones invading overwhelming aircraft, aircraft carriers, defence systems, as individually they are cheap as chips, but they can carry... Uh, a, a, you know, a bad and nasty message uh, to us. So we can be overwhelmed by these forms of, of engagement. And this picture I thought I'd show you, and I, I hope you can see it, those little lights, uh, each individual one of those is a drone flying. It's in the United States. Intel put this on to try and beat their own record. It's 1,500 drones flying, <coughs> showing different colored lights, <laughs> and controlled by one person. It's quite amazing, isn't it? And that's just one person being able to do that. So thousands of drones operating to a pre-planned uh, exercise. Uh, it wouldn't matter if you wiped out 500. You've still got 1,000 able to deliver whatever they were planning to deliver. And equally, we're making drones for ships. The Americans are, the British are. This is a drone ship from the Royal Navy. And increasingly, this is the Chinese. And you won't be able to see it terribly well, but these are lines of, of, of boats. They're all drones. There's 56 of them. And this is the Chinese Swarm Drone Navy able to take on adversaries without any uh, human involvement whatsoever. So that becomes quite interesting. Equally, the, t the, the ability to control all of that environment, technologically, with radio waves and communications that secure uh, and command and control, is the big deal. So it's about controlling who has that. But I thought I'd show you, first of all, this, this is a launch, depending on the mission requirements. Well, I didn't think it had voice, but it does. This is an air-launched uh, nano-drone, and it can fly down and, uh, and find its way into buildings and places. But what's quite interesting is one of the drones is quite bird-like. And if you watch this, this is an air-launched drone that's perched on this wire to stay there for ages. It uses sunlight as a power source and vibration and other things. And it has a camera in here to look, look down at an individual. And that's passed back to a control center, and that person in the system identify them as valid or not valid as a target. And of course, if they move off, this can launch itself again and follow it. That's just part of what these things can do. Uh, it's quite interesting, and the cost of that is next to nothing, uh, and the exposure of risk is almost zero. And you don't know where it came from, so you can't politically come back at me because you don't know where it came from, and I can destroy it anyway. So I can have that, but so can they. And this is a really interesting, exciting thing about all these new technologies. Exciting. So controlling, controlling that environment electronically, the, the electronic weapons, the cyber operatives are the new heroes, if you like, being able to contain that in some way 
And you can see how we struggle when Heathrow was closed for how many days? Or was it Gatwick? Gatwick? Heathrow? Gatwick. It was closed for so many days. We, did, we knew that we thought there was a drone there, but we couldn't find it. Oh, come on. You know, honestly. And unfortunately, we had to borrow uh, the equipment from a contractor, which is fine, given our networking approach. There's nothing wrong with that. It gets presented the wrong way, but there's nothing wrong with having partners who can do things that we can call on. So um, what else do you say about this? What's more interesting is that, it's, it, as I said, that cobot collaboration between man and machine has always been a big issue, but now it becomes uh, pretty much vital that we speed ourselves up so that we can respond to the ability of all of this. And some folk are looking at, and by the way, this works, where <laughs> humans can, using skull caps and technology, can talk to machines quicker. So we can get rid of words, we can get rid of a lot of other things, I guess you have to concentrate a bit on what you're doing, otherwise heaven knows what happens. But, you know, <laughs> broadly speaking, this works, and it works in hospitals, it works in command and control systems, and at the very beginning, it's that early tank, early submarine era of that sort of thought wave management of technology so you can have a two-way communication. And, of course, virtual reality. Who's, who, who looks at virtual reality? Have you got virtual reality at home? VR? VR? You all try VR headsets, okay? Yeah. Well, VR takes you... It's the first time in technology where you're not looking at technology anymore, you're in it. And that's the difference. You're not looking, you're in it. So you can turn around. But the military are using that. This is actually a US core. They're using the HoloLens from Microsoft. Um, but what's interesting, they can, they can go into <coughs> situations before they land and become very familiar. So the virtual reality world you create can help with, with uh, acclimatization, training, development. And it's already being used for training. This is a parachutist in the States. This is a, a British troops using a VR headset for inland uh, experience training. So again, being, being prepared and ready to engage when you already know the area. This is a US example where they've actually certified 13 pilots to fly only using VR. So they've gone from four and a half million pounds for a simulator to a thousand dollars. That's dollars, sorry, four and a half million to a thousand dollars. So these things are very easily deployed and very cheap and very realistic. I think I put a film in there. Um, yeah, so this is a, a, a training for a flyer to learn how to take off from a, a, an aircraft carrier to take part in combat and, and re land again. So I won't go around that anymore, but essentially, those things, <coughs> those games, the things we always blamed our kids for being a waste of time, turns out they're not. It turns out they are the best rear gunners. They, they are the people who are going to be able to fly our aircraft. They're actually going to fly real drones. And then, of course, we'll have drones flying themselves. But essentially, that's not a waste of time. All of that stuff they were doing, turns out it was good. So we won't say much about that when we get home, because it's a bit late anyway. <laughs> Equally, um, we are able to edit um, the gene now fairly effectively with CRISPR, which is a technology that's well advanced, so we can... We can remove illness uh, and predictable illness, which is good, but we can also enhance people. And this is a bit difficult because people aren't quite sure if it's ethically right. So we can make you more uh, long-lasting, if you like, uh, your, your endurance greater, uh, or we can adapt mosquitoes to fly into the enemy zone and to deliver um, fatal doses uh, of various um, poison. And that already exists. So we, 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 that, that already exists. Equally, what's really fun, BAE are growing uh, drones. They're growing drones. So this is their view. So we'll start off with, in, in a fluid pool. Well, you won't see, oh, you are. In a fluid pool, they're growing drones that are very cheap, very quick, and very flexible in what characteristics you give those drones. And this doesn't quite work, by the way, you'll be pleased to know, but it's very much at the cutting edge of where they're going. And of course, ultimately, those drones can then support uh, troops and engagement uh, and are very disposable. You know, if they get blown up, who cares? If they get shot down, who cares? We just bring a thousand more and they can overwhelm the enemy uh, and give us amazing um, intelligence. So those sorts of drones are around. Equally, 3D printing are producing missiles. So this is a 3D printed missile. We're 3D printing houses. We are just on the edge of being able to 3D print a heart and a kidney and a liver. So if you damage the last one, you can have a new one. Fitting it's a bit of a challenge, but nonetheless, you've still got to... Uh, you can have those things replaced. It's your DNA, it's your biomass that's being used to build the new organ that you can replace. 
and that it's almost viable. It's literally months away from being viable. I dare say we'll spend 20 years discussing the, the efficacy of it, um, but it's actually already working, and it's been used on uh, mammals. And ma I Just a very quick picture here. It's almost hard to see, but believe it or not, this thing down here is a device speeded up horribly, and it turns out that when that's finished, um, it makes a car. <laughs> and that car is running, and it's made out of less than 10% of the parts of the average motor vehicle. So it's very attractive, very disposable, very easy to edit and correct at any point in time. Equally, egg safe ske skeletons are already being used in um, uh, logistics centres, but we're all arming our, our military, our troops, with these sorts of egg safe skeletons that make them more powerful, give them longer endurance, and ability to take larger weights and walk further uh, than ever before. So these things ultimately actually folk who are committed to wheelchairs at the moment uh, there are a number of technologies, and this is one that could help them walk again. So that is taken over completely uh, from where you were. Equally, the Russians have got one. Uh, they say they've used it in battle, which is interesting, but they say they have, even though they announced it's ready in 2025, so I'm not sure how they got on with that. But then, nonetheless, that's coming now. This is the Ratnik, Russian for warrior. Uh, it has servos and sensors in it, so it can tell how you are and what state you're in. It's a bit like Iron Man, if you like, on the cheap. Uh, so you, know, you can't fly in it yet, but who knows, that might come next. But broadly speaking, these things could be the, the standard for troops. And of course, we can then body armour uh, troops who aren't going to be burdened with the weight of that uh, in the future when we've got servos helping them uh, walk and manoeuvre. So quite an interesting scenario. The next thing, of course, we've now got, and this does work, we've got uh, artificial red blood cells that allow you to run at top speed for 20 minutes or swim underwater for 20 so you can do amazing feats. Two hours. Oh, two hours. For two hours. They're 20 minutes running, two hours <laughs> swimming underwater. And that then means you can do greater feats uh, than you ever could before with less aid and, and, and more, uh, more discreet. So, okay. Augmenting, augmenting people in that way, helping us do things better, uh, as truth is going to happen, and that already is well on the way, and that's not the first time we've ever done that. Uh, brain devices, this one already works. Uh, we've tried it on uh, small mammals and where we've been able to test. Um, humans have been able to be 40% uh, better at learning uh, new behaviours or skills. So a massive increase in... We should plug our son into that, actually, for his A-levels. But broadly speaking, these, these tools are, um, are increasingly become available. And, of course, self-guiding bullets are something of the fiction world, if you like, but... They're now trying those at DARPA, and you can't see this, but... I, I DARPA has been working on making and testing self-guided bullets for some time, and recently they announced that their efforts are proving increasingly successful. The official name of the project is the Extreme Accuracy Task Ordinance, or Exacto for short. Its goal is to create a projectile that compensates for variables out of the shooter's control, such as moving and evading targets. The bullets work by utilizing built-in optical sensors that read wind speeds, weather, and changes in mark position. They then adjust their trajectory accordingly. Tests performed just this past February showed that the technology is coming along quite well. Video taken of the trials show that both experienced and novice gunmen using the bullets were able to hit non-stationary targets with great precision. Well, that's the first Central time you've done a DARPA program manager. This live fire. So the things that we think are science fiction are looking like they're being come to pass. So we can shoot around corners, and we can shoot around people's heads, and we can basically deviate from straight line firing. We've got robots that can help in the battlefield and carry weights. We've got a NATO tank, which is autonomous, and a Russian tank, which is autonomous. So I guess they fight each other. But, you know, everything is increasingly already being tested and close, if not already deployed. And, of course, you saw earlier on a robot insect, which is quite common now, to go and, and spy out the land, so to speak. So all of those are changing. You've got non-lethal weapons, which the Russians are creating and deploying, which is pulse light, apparently, which causes hallucinations and disorientation and nausea. And you've got, this is a Chinese one, as it happens, Mach 5, five times the speed of sound um, missiles, which are going to be harder to interdict and give us even less time to talk about what do we do about it. We've, we've got to know how we're going to do something with it before it gets anywhere close to us, given the speed. So gene editing, so we can change everything the way we are. Uh, laser weapons, which we're just about to test. The UK Dragonfly, um, uh, Dragonfire system. That's been talked about last year and is ready for test this year. 
You've got constellations that anybody can put a constellation up in space now. <coughs> uh, they're that, satellites are that big. Uh, and we're talking about four or 5,000 being put up every year. And any corporation, university, or country can put up satellite systems for all manner of reasons. And of course, insurgents can do exactly the same if they get together. And 20 of those will be in a constellation to do a certain job by 2022. So you know, we're going to be fairly crowded up there fairly soon with satellites. Equally, how we regulate it, it depends to some degree if you're on top or not. And that's been true ever. You know, how much do we want to regulate this stuff, depending on what advantage we've got from it, and somebody who might be against it, uh, where are they? Equally, the UK uh, at, in the United Nations has been discussing banning la laser weapons and uh, uh, autonomous weapons from lacking any human control for the very reasons we can imagine it could get out of control very easily, but we haven't even sorted out yet how to uh, non-proliferate space with military activity, and of course China's now getting active up there, so we don't know what's going to happen there. Equally, we've got masses, as I said, of countries who can each put up um, satellites as we go forward and collect payloads and destroy them, and we've got these sort of automated robots who can take part in battle that are already working. These, these already exist. So the questions are really how would you oversee a, a ban over non-state actors? How, how would you even know what they're doing? How could, you, how could you regulate that? Equally, how could you police tech barriers when they're so low that anybody can embrace these new technologies and use them to whatever end they want? And finally, if it's a dual-use technology, how do you contain the commercial side of that world which can be used for military purposes? So it's, it's a really interesting world we're entering into. It is quite exciting in many ways. It's quite threatening. But if we get on top of it early, it'll be a good thing for us for a lot of good reasons. Uh, and, and that will change. And equally, the bayonet will always have a role, whether it's called a sword or a bayonet. Its role will be there as a last resort, if you like. Uh, equally, the button will still exist for all of the ICBMs and things that we have control over. But maybe it's a world we're entering. It's the attack of the killer robots. It'll be the overwhelming nature of how things change in the future. And ultimately, I suppose it's worthwhile having a, a motto that says swift and bold in a time of so much change. Thank you very much. I'm glad I retired. Ladies <laughs> <laughs> and gentlemen, questions, please. What uh, was sort of defence? I mean, electromagnetic pulse, um, your own computers. How would you defend against these things? Well, screening, number one. So you, you, there is a degree of screening. So you can put, you can put up a, a pulse around it if you like. You can put your own screen, but that's not that effective yet because it doesn't work entirely. You can screen individual components so they don't get fried by, by the opposition. But that's actually not the issue. The issue could be uh, them simply acting um, in your environment. These devices coming in with weapons, with explosives, with um, intelligent gathering... Uh, and actually interdicting them is quite difficult. So actually, we have, to have, we have to have an equal number of these things. And that's what, I guess that's why we have a sort of fourth arm, if you like. The, you know, GC, GCHQ is, is where all of this is being considered. And so how do you defend against it? And actually, we're not defending brilliantly against cyber threats. And we've put an awful lot off that could have happened. But what's more interesting is that we're about to open the doors with Internet of Things. You're all into that, you know, electronic doorbells and cameras at home doing something or things that drive your heating system. All of those currently probably are unsecure. All of them. There is no security um, protocol agreed for what's viewed to be hundreds of millions in five years. So the issue is much, much bigger than just simply a one-off attack of some sort. It's actually what do you do with all those open doors? that control the way our world works. That's enough of that. Uh, you, said, you, you said earlier on that we're going to be, humans are going to be uh, drenched, uh, completely swamped by the amount of data that a future uh, technology is going to produce. In that case, which is clearly obviously going to happen, how is it that humans are going to control, as you said right at the end of your talk, when in fact they won't be able to uh, <coughs> cope with the, all the information, and the only thing that can will be computers or robots. 
Oh, well, I'm glad you asked that. Right, you, you answered your own question. Because our command of various forms of technology, artificial intelligence, data analytics, visual analytics, that we are relying on that, uh, allowing us to control the data. I mean, it took, one, it took 40 years to get one zettabyte of data in the, first, the start of the internet and the dig digital age, if you call it that. We're now forecasting in 10 years 500 yottabytes, which is 500,000 zettabytes. So the amount of data is beyond belief. It's just beyond belief. And the only way we control that for anybody is to automate how we manage it and interpret it and draw off information. So technology. Mm. But the risk is sounding a little Englander. It seems to me that one of the risks to which we are currently exposed is the global economy and the way um, companies from other countries are buying into our national infrastructure. I read this morning that there are something like five of the national train operating companies mm. are owned by um, foreign countries. Mm. Um, you mentioned Huawei. Um, the IBM laptop business was sold to China, and I've <laughs> never heard about um, any security problems around those, but maybe they're just being kept quiet. I mean, are we not already exposed in many ways other than from pure weapon systems? Corporately, yes. I mean, most of those are publicly owned, and therefore uh, anybody can buy shares. So, yeah, I mean, people have been buying shares, whether it's strategic or whether it's just because they've got a great deal of wealth. Um, who knows? Time will tell. But what's interesting in the U.S., the, tre the, the amount of treasury bonds that China owns in the U.S., any negotiation that the U.S. has with China is massively influenced with their ability to crash the U.S. economy. Yeah. So that they've invested that over a long period of time as a long play. So economic warfare is as strong as cyber warfare, is as strong as uh, all those other forms. I mean, I didn't want to say any more, but you know, it, it is absolutely right that ownership and control is very diverse, and it will become increasingly more diverse. The only good news is that China basically stole everything. Let's just use China as an example. There's plenty of others developing. China, broadly speaking, stole all its IP and copyright for years. It was always predicted when they started to own companies that owned copyright and IP, they'd have to start defending it. And that's exactly what's happened. They are increasingly being put into a position where they have to protect their ownership of IP that it's in firms abroad, but it's ownership, if you like, they own, but they want to protect it. They want that firm to succeed. So they're being hoisted by their own ability to generate cash for investment. So they will, they will follow the same rules, hopefully. Hopefully. So at the moment we've got the uh, Royal Navy, Royal Air Force, the Army, three very distinct and, and different separate roles in the way they function. Um, for example, in Afghanistan now, the drone footage of um, maybe a terrorist being taken out by a drone, which is controlled locally on the ground, rather than by the RAF and a typhoon or something. How far away are we from having one branch of the armed forces, the Royal Cyber Force, or something like that? <laughs> all, all of these, all these, becoming very much more locally controlled as ground-based platforms. I, I don't know the answer to that because that's a very political question um, and it's very weighted. So, it, yeah, how that will and if that will come around is another matter. What I think should happen is like that first diagram I put up about how we need to reorganise. It's multiple components of different resources combining for a particular task to engage in that way, and then, if you like, dispersing. What size that component is, is the discussion in town. You know, we have a regiment system in, in the UK that's, that's stood the test of time. Maybe we keep that together. But it's components. We don't call it an army, necessarily. But we have components to do different things. That would include GCHQ. Would it would include collaborating commercial companies, sufficiently protected by... Um, contract uh, and participants in the military. So it's liable to be mixes of all. David, none of the comments that you showed there from various individuals came from a politician. 
um, least of all a British politician, how capable do you think our, um, our government <laughs> uh, politicians are of, um, of commanding and leading us in such an environment? Um. <laughs> Mentioning Before I said anything, <laughs> we discussed this over lunch today because, you know, I, I am saying I cannot understand the patience of the military of dealing with our politicians. <laughs> it's beyond me, yeah. quite frankly. Uh, 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 these guys will never see tomorrow because they're not, they're not rewarded on the future. They're only rewarded about their popularity today. So they are the worst people that we engage to run democracy for us. So our system is, is, a, is at fault. It, it focuses in the wrong place, and, and it's beyond me how you get a job in the top of government. It's beyond me. I think it's the least worst of whatever's happening at the time. You get the job. And like most things, it's just for fun of it, I'll say it, you know, sometimes you, call, you, you need a statesman to rise a, amongst the rabble and lead. And you have to hope in times of crisis that that happens, whether we're in one or another matter. But you know, in times of military crisis, I, I would have to believe there would be somebody for that moment who would rise and, and, and make the difference. But it's, you know, like today it's a shambles. Mm-hmm. Well, it's been recorded. Mm-hmm. It. <laughs> you can edit that. Yeah. On, your, on your slides, you're building up, there is a considerable amount of industry involved in research. Um, just as an observation, most of them look like small companies, don't they? Like yep. the big giants. Yep. Um, a few years ago, when I was going through university, things like Technology never really matched customer or user expectations. It seems it's, it's gone the other way. Technology now exceeds our expectations. We, we don't think of things that we can use it for. It's beyond that. So it's, we've got more choice from all that range of research and that great map of different industries in, 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 in that space. How do we make the right choice about what technology to invest in? Where, does, where are we going to go with it? Choosing cohorts of te- styles of technology, types of technology, is hard enough. But choosing individual firms who can rise above it is even harder. I mean, the advice to most organisations is create an interesting watering hole, and the interesting ones will come to you, because they don't all do the same thing. They may all look, <coughs> they may all come and look like they're in the same sector, but they're doing different things. I used to go to in the city there were in the insurance industry, one of which I know well. It, it, there used to be Instech conferences. And they're young hopefuls, young people with lots of money, with disastrous solutions. I mean, honestly, no one would ever get anywhere close to it in a million years. And after about three or four, I gave up going. So it's impossible to pick your way through these thousands of companies, many of which are startups, but many of which are backed by big companies. So they've got that backing and hope of absorbing what they learn from it and then growing it. So it's, it's a whole experiment and, and grow fast or, or kill is, is very much in town. But choosing them is not so easy. Getting them to choose you is probably smarter. Because the, the effort you could put in to try and find the right company, whether it's in Indonesia, whether it's in Romania, whether it's in the United States, whether it's in Silicon Roundabout in, in the city, you would wear yourself out trying to find it. But if you create an interesting watering hole around a problem, then these people are desperate for people to talk to. Is your point exactly. that They are desperate to find outlets for their thinking and then you can control who comes into your kimono and start engaging them in some way. So it's the opposite way around we used to do things. Usable. John, do you want to follow up? One last one, an entirely different tack. Um, right at the very beginning, the emerging seven, um, due to exceed in wealth, the, um, the G7, do you think that might lead to them becoming the most attractive target for all the refugee floods that are happening? <laughs> Brazil, Russia, I, India, I will Russia and Turkey. China, Turkey, Indonesia, Mexico. No. <laughs> well, they may be wealthy, but they may not have very, very, very um, mature infrastructure, very mature environments, very safe environments, whatever. So they're still good <clears> to us because we're nice. Possibly. Yeah. Hey, uh, what seems to come through is that the traditional concept of conquest is gone um, and is going to be replaced by <coughs> disruption. Um, and that disruption or the capability of disruption um, is not going to be the prerogative of necessarily large, powerful states because actually 
quite small countries, for example Israel, um, have been extraordinarily successful in the electronic field mm. and the military electronic field. Or would you like to make a sort of general comment on that? Well, I think that's very true in terms of scale of, of operative. <coughs> also very creative in, in, in biology and health. So an amazingly creative environment. Um, but you say conquest is gone. Actually, conquest hasn't quite gone. But actually, whether we're prepared to, um, to respond to conquest, because it's that grey areas again. If, if the opposition have a way of damaging us so sufficiently <coughs> that it isn't worth it for that, is it worth it for that? Those a few islands in the South China Sea, is it worth it? Is it three islands? Is it five islands? Are we willing to have our financial markets crash for ten islands? Does Vietnam losing its base in the South China Sea, does that matter? Well, no, no, no that's okay. We don't want the financial services to crash. So it's that amazing game that their ability to disrupt us is the game in town uh, versus their, they still may want to, for example, in South China Sea, China claims all of it. Irrespective, it goes well past Vietnam, well past Philippines, Indonesia, and they claim it's all theirs, which is what that fishing fleet is running around uh, being a bit of a menace for. But you're right about the, um, the, the scale isn't the issue anymore. It's the, you can project way above your weight if you just employ these tools. But there will no longer necessarily be the concept of holding ground, yeah. occupying um, the enemy or the enemy states or whatever it is. That will, that, that, yeah. I, again, I don't think that's true. I, I think there will be that. Only where those things, not necessarily between major states, because the consequences are too great, you could argue. But for the minor areas of the world that no one cares about, and I said that deliberately, not, not that we don't care about it, but sort of politically folk don't really get overly worked up about, um, those could be taken, and the ground held. I mean, if you look at those, the concrete that's being poured in some of those atolls in the South China Seas, you can see exactly that. Where militaristic bases with a runway on an atoll turn into land, and then claiming 200 miles exclusion zone around it. So there is a form of, of taking land and, and owning it. Well, others who might want to take another view to that have got to think about what do you do as a consequence. Thank you, John. Looking at the HR aspects for the military of some of the things that you've described, including autonomous weapons, by which I take you mean men, uh, weapons without necessarily a man in the loop at all. Yes. I wonder if we're recruiting the right sort of person. You don't have to be very gallant to sit in a bunker at RAF Benson uh, and control a drone over Afghanistan. You don't necessarily have to be very quick at decision making or, or luck. Luck is uh, the unknown. Uh, but I wonder if you'd like to just expand on the, on the HR aspects. I would think the military are in exactly the same position as everybody else in this regard. Um, there is a discussion about an uh, uh, underclass being created. And that's a horrible thing to say, and it's rather nasty and direct, of people who probably can't take part in this new economy because skills are being shifted up. So the skills you need to engage are higher because machines of one sort or another, be that arm of a robot doing work in a factory to taking over managerial jobs, and people say 30% of a CEO's job can be automated with a machine. Uh, 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 the only problem is, do you really want to have two-thirds of miserable stuff and not have the third you used to like? So the, the issues about HR are massive. It's, it's a bit like, I will come back to the main point, but it's a bit like, why do we let people fly airplanes today? Because they're broadly speaking a menace. If you ever watch air crash investigation, it's rather too frequently, it's, it's a pilot's involvement that didn't work out too well by confusion or whatever. Uh, but we do it because at some point the machine may break down and they need to take it over. So you've got some really interesting scenarios which say, do we need to cover what we're doing by uh, human beings if we lose the technology? So it's a massive problem for a any recruitment of, of people. Do they need to have the old skills and be able to deploy things, but don't actually get a chance to practice it because those things are done for them by other systems? And, but if they get knocked out, you go, it isn't like you get slightly knocked out. You get completely wiped away, that whole strata of defence, and now you're left with the traditional. And if you're not planned for it or doing it, you're, you're really quite in a struggle. Mm -hmm. So I think it's, it's not sorted out. It's not sorted out in the commercial world. 
The only thing I do know, interestingly enough, I'll say this last thing on that, is I was with a bank um, uh, four or five weeks ago and we were running a day session and it's about skills of the future they need to acquire. And half the room were full of HR people, the other half were procurement. Because it's not about who we own anymore, it's about who we know. So do I know the right people that I can bring in to do what I need? And not the front line, because that's not anybody who necessarily want to go and do that. But can I bring people in to fill the gap of what I, what I need to do on a temporary basis, even? And maybe there's a role there. So we'll change the nature of it. You don't have a question. This is my wife. <laughs> the gentleman who just asked that question, you were asking something about character. Yes. yes. Can, you, can you just expand on that a moment? Yes, well, I just wonder if we're looking for the right character set, if you want to put it that way. Um, as I say, you don't need to be very gallant no, to sit in a bunker and uh, control a drone over Afghanistan. You do have to have other skills. Uh, somewhere there has to be a decision maker. And I wasn't sure uh, from what David was saying whether decision making is being speeded up because it seems to me to, that's a limiting, a limiting constraint on a, on a senior officer. Yes. So do you think losing the character of people in, in war is going to be, have, a huge, it will have a huge effect on people's decisions and the outcome, won't it? Well, I hope we wouldn't. I mean, I genuinely hope we wouldn't, because if you had a completely man-automated way of engaging in warfare, it would be a disaster, because things would happen in all manner of ways that you wouldn't pull back from, perhaps, or you wouldn't wouldn't do. You know, collateral damage, which is a nice way of saying other people who are taking, you know, being taken out of the consequences, the machines, you may say, up to three people, average age 43, but not children below 12. And when he finds that scenario, it goes into bat. But somebody with a bit more wisdom may say that's just not the right thing to go and do at this moment. We'll, take it, we'll do it another day. So I, I'm not saying we should get rid of um, people with a character to express ourselves. We don't stop being the people we want to be simply because we've got machines able to do all this. The day we give that over completely to automation, we are in a little bit of trouble, mm. because you can manipulate that any way you like. There's got to be a moral component somewhere in all of this. Mm. And building that into AI is going to be really hard. Very, very hard, because there isn't probably one set of rules that would always apply at all times. You probably know what the right thing is to do, whereas machines would find that quite difficult. Mm. Time for one more. Go on. Uh, is there any likelihood, do you think, of international major parties getting together to create a new Geneva sort of convention for uh, modern warfare to control some of these things before they actually start causing a problem? Um, well, there should be. There is, there is a lot of work going on in individual nations and the United Nations are bringing people together on a regular basis to talk about the ethics and banning types of, of weaponry. And sometimes that's been successful in the past. We haven't used gases since the First World War, except for broadly speaking. So it can be successful. If you ask me the question, will people come together and will there be groups who, are, who will fight these things? Yes. I mean, some people are saying there should be no autonomous weapons. Full stop. Because of where that might lead. No human being involved in the chain of command to use those weapons. But do you know of any movement within a major powers to, to have a convention before the problem arises. It's, it's happening in the auspices of the United Nations right now. And the UK has already taken part in some of those meetings. I put up there one side, I think, one point Geneva. They took part in mid last year in Geneva with, with a, a, a cohort of countries who are doing exactly <coughs> that. Okay, we're looking at laser, sound, pain, machines, artificial intelligence, autonomous weaponry, battlefield, ships, rockets, all, all of that. The problem is it's myriad. There's so much of it. Mm. I don't know how they'll fare, but there are people doing exactly that. It's very interesting your talk, because there was a film, I think, in the 80s called Runaway, and Tom Selleck was a police officer. He wasn't policing the streets, he was policing robots, automated houses, and in that they also had a guided bullet. <laughs> and there you go. And we're back to science fiction yeah, again. That was in the 80s. <laughs> right, Liz, right thanks we'll, very much. We'll, we'll let David off the hook. <coughs> he's, uh, he's more than a drink and a nibble. Um, <laughs> I find that absolutely fascinating, and uh, I don't know I don't know how the military is going to cope with it. When um, I'm talking to a chap who's just been put in charge of uh, of um, a branch in the army to look at 
you know, future, proper future developments, or sort of cyber developments. And he was saying that the new Army Combat Reconnaissance Vehicle, the idea of it started, uh, the planning and drawing and uh, discussion about it started in the mid-1990s. And uh, they've eventually changed it so many times that uh, they've got a model they're going to work on now. It's going to be diesel-operated, and it's going to come into service in 2030, which is the year in which the government has decided that diesel is going to be banned <laughs> from vehicles. So there's something wrong with our procurement system, quite clearly. Uh, and how we crack that, I don't know. I mean, my, I'm bemused by all of that, and I'd say quite glad I've retired, because I don't think I get my mind around it. But David, thank you very much indeed. That was absolutely fascinating. Brilliant. You've more than earned your, your drink and nibble, and supper's on me tonight. <laughs> 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 <laughs>